Historicism is the belief that was held by the majority of the Protestant reformers, including Martin Luther, John Calvin, Thomas Cranmer, and John Knox. Meanwhile, the Catholic Church tried to counter it with an alternate view, such as that put forward by the Jesuit Francisco Ribera during its counter-reformation. This alternate view served to bolster the Catholic Church position against Protestant criticism and as a Catholic defense against the historicist view, which identifies the Roman Church as a persecuting apostasy and the papacy as the seat of the Antichrist. Presently, most of the evangelical and Christian world believe some version of the futurist Catholic Counter-Reformation view of prophecy. The historicist interpretation reveals the entire course of history of the Church from the close of the first century to the end of time, which must necessarily be revised as new events and figures emerge on the world scene. This series is an up-to-date outline of the historicist view of the Revelation. Lecture 26, The Song of the 144,000, Supplemental History of the True Church, as Distinguished from the Nominal, Revelation 14, 1 through 20. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Sion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts, and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty-four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven, and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she hath made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, 
he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even to the horses' bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. The series of supplemental visions, written, as it were, on the outside of the apocalyptic scroll, which we noticed in our 25th lecture, as entered upon at the beginning of Revelation chapter 12, is continued to the end of chapter 14. While the usurper of Christ's supremacy had been exalting himself against God and blaspheming, with Rome for his capital, and the world wondering after him, worshipping him, and receiving his mark, they were all the while in existence, though trampled on and oppressed, another city and another people, the followers of the Lamb, with their Father's name upon their foreheads. They had been, on the commencement of the apostasy, depicted as the subjects of divine grace, elected out of the symbolic Israel, and sealed as the 144,000, preserve amongst the judgments of false Christendom, and witnessing against the evils that increased around them. They yet remained indestructible and were ultimately triumphant. These 144,000 are now again pictured to St. John, presenting a beautiful and animating contrast to the visions of the anti-Christian man of sin and his people, while the latter gathered round their Romish Babylon and the great image of the beast, and do worship also the work of their own hands. The true church is represented upon Mount Zion in the presence of the Lamb himself, singing and harping before the throne of God. We have before observed how that upon the cleansing of the figurative temple at the Reformation and the ascent of the witnesses, a voice of thanksgiving arose from the redeemed and gave glory to the God of heaven. It was the same occasion and the same song which is here again described. We have heard how Luther sang it, Thou, Jesus, art my righteousness, I am thy sin. Thou hast taken on thyself what was mine, Thou hast given me what was thine. It was this doctrine of our sinfulness and Christ's righteousness and blood atoning that was introduced as their very essence into the ritual and services of the Reformed churches and was their distinctive characteristic. Taking then this as the Reformed church's song, what are we to understand by there being some who could not learn it. Does it not seem to imply that there would still continue that nominal profession, distinct from real religion, which had before the Reformation marked the course of the Church's progress? Let us then test this from the history of the Protestant Churches, from that period to the time of the French Revolution in the end of the 18th century. We pass over Belgium, Spain, Portugal and Italy, countries where the Protestant Church was never established, but was expelled as soon as discovered by the papal weapons of the Inquisition, fire and sword. And we pause for a moment on France. Here the Reformation had been introduced under fair condition, and Protestants had for more than a century been tolerated and protected. Henry of Nevers, who after the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day, had renounced the Reformed religion, and so procured for himself the crown, had nevertheless, by the well-known Edict of Nantes, A.D. 1598, confirmed to the Protestants, who now formed a third of the kingdom, the utmost security and freedom. But the revocation of this edict in A.D. 1685 by Louis XIV 
at the instigation of the Jesuits, withdrew this protection and exposed them to prison and death. Forty thousand took refuge in England, while those who remained in France, for the most part, were obligated to conform to the Romish Church. This persecution did not, however, take place until the religious fervor of the Reformed Church had declined, and it had become, in character, more of a chivalrous than of a Christian body. But what of the countries where the Reformation had been cradled and established? What of northern Germany, Denmark, Holland, England, and the Reformed cantons of Switzerland? Alas, in each of these we shall find the predictive clause, but too well verified. Take the case of Germany. Though the protest against Rome was distinct, and though much orthodox religious profession continued, yet real vital piety waxed colder and colder, and there was little of the holding forth in spirit and in act the word of life, so that when the Thirty Years' War had desolated Germany from 1618 to 1648, and Protestant thought itself was periled, it was confessed that the judgment was righteous and well-deserved. But no revival took place. Greater energies were developed, but they were the energies of a bold and intellectual spirit, judging of Scripture truth by weak philosophy, and tending to skepticism and apostasy. The rationalist theology of the latter half of the 18th century was its consequence. Could there be, amongst those who held these views, any understanding of the new song of redemption and justification through the Savior's blood and mediation? Certainly not. The doctrine had been cast off as the creed of a bygone age, and the gospel itself, its inspiration denied, was considered as a book adopted only for Judaic times, and having but little to do with eternal truth or eternal philosophy. It has been said that the want of liturgies and creeds and church establishments had somewhat to do with this decline of piety on the continent. But if so, what shall be said of England and England's church, where her liturgy and ritual, embodying in its services and creeds all the essential doctrines of salvation, and ministered by regulated and supported clergy? As the eye rests on the two and a half centuries alluded to in a former sketch, from the time when, under Edward VI, the Reformation was perfected and their liturgy, services, and articles were arranged by Cranmer and others, and contemplates the efforts made by Bishop Land to corrupt that ritual by mixing up with it a pure worship, mysterious popish rites and ceremonies, then the fanaticism of Cromwell's time, then the skepticism and levity of the laity in the reign of Charles II, and then observes the heartlessness and utter want of spirituality in the century following, especially amongst the clergy. The inference seems plain that no human means can give real piety of heart. God's Spirit must redo and sanctify the spirit of man, or man's heart and man's systems must fail. Such we infer to be the lesson taught in the vision before us, in that no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. There were many eminent men who during this dark period were used by God as instruments to help forward the light of truth and keep alive the fire of true devotion. In Germany, for example, are Spencer and Frank of the Lutheran churches, besides many in the Moravian body. In England, with the established church, Hooker and Ken, Usher and Haw, Leighton and Beveridge, Hopkins and Walker, Newton and Venn. Among the nonconformists, Baxter and Howe, Watts and Doddridge, Whitfield and Wesley. These, with many others, and of honorable women not a few, stand out in relief as honored by God in the promotion of His glory. 
America also had its burning and shining lights. Doubtless there were many more during these years of comparative darkness, unmarked by any save the eye which sees all, of whose character the scripture gives beautiful testimony. As to purity of heart and holiness, they are virgins, the Lamb's affianced bride. As to active, practical, and self-denying conduct, they follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These, if they did not suffer under the hostility of popish adversaries, were yet oft times compelled to go without the camp, bearing the reproach of Christ their Lord, he that knoweth them that are his, in this place pointedly marks his approval. In their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Their record was on high, but justice has in our days been done to them. We rejoice to think that with the numbers of their writings, they are now esteemed and their memory is blessed. As the 18th century advanced, the voice of the 144,000 wax fainter and feebler, and their existence might, to the outward eye of man, appear a doubtful matter, especially in the continental countries and churches. In Germany, rationalism ruled supreme, and its spirit extended to the kindred churches of Sweden and Denmark. In Holland, a lethargy that denoted the absence of all spirituality and life was the prevailing character of the Protestant religion. In Switzerland, Unitarian thought, with its paralyzing influence, had blighted the true doctrine which Calvin had once so fully confessed and taught. Thus the symptoms were not wanting, which showed that popery was becoming aged and reft of much of its former vigor. Yet, in case of any new attack upon the gospel truth, such as might arise from threatening infidelity, there appeared in the declining state of piety, on all sides, but little zeal or power to oppose it, either amongst the Protestant or the Romish churches. In England, almost alone, it seemed the salt had not absolutely lost all savor. The light, well nigh extinct, began to burn brighter. Elsewhere the darkness thickened. Could it be that the Blessed Reformation had ended in failure? If such a doubt had crossed the mind of St. John at this point, the next vision must have dissipated it, when the missionary angel was seen to fly in the midst of heaven, giving glorious token of revival and triumph to the Church, as also of warning to those who either opposed or still neglected the message. When Jesus at the synagogue of Nazareth, opened the Bible to Isaiah 61 and read the verse, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, he closed the book. And giving it to the minister, he said, this day is the scripture fulfilled, announcing himself as the appointed prophet to deliver this message from God. To preach the day of vengeance was not his commission. The gospel, he declared, must first be published among all nations. Here then, ere the end come, we have the angel commissioned again with the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, and bidding every nation and kindred and tongue and people fear God and give glory to Him. He announces also the startling fact, the hour of His judgment has come. He claims the reverence due to omnipotence as God's right. Worship him that made heaven and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. This vision, however, as also the two following, are in this supplementary, or without written series, given only in brief, and each is taken up afterwards in the regular, or within written course, as a separate and distinct occurrence. The former we shall have to notice in a following lecture. The two latter belong to later expositors, and are consequently beyond the scope of our present design. Meanwhile, there are words of comfort given to the children of God at the very first announcement 
of the vile judgments. The first angel brings with him the gospel, or glad tidings to all, before pronouncing the woe that must follow its rejection. The second angel announces the speedy fall of Babylon, that enemy and rival of the Christian church, while a third pronounces woe upon those who still remain in her once the call is gone forth, even the wine of the wrath of God and fiery destruction, adding, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, before announcing the awful final judgments. Another angel or voice from heaven declares, Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord, and the Spirit of God himself gives the encouragement. They rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. How terrible, and yet how precious, is the word of God, according as it is addressed to the unbelieving or to the faithful. Like the pillar of fire, it is a cloud and darkness to them, but it gives light to these.